Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Jay Becker. Uh, I'm here for Refuse Fascism Chicago tonight, and I want to welcome everyone on behalf of the Refuse Fascism Chicago chapter. Um, first, uh, thank you uh, to Voice of the City, the space here, for opening up their space to us. And thank you to Can TV, an incredible asset to everyone seeking change in this city. And we also want to uh, congratulate them on their 35th anniversary this year. <laughs> the order of events tonight is first, uh, Michelle Ponce de Leon will speak briefly. Then we'll watch a short video that will give everyone a certain basic um, background on the events in South Korea that we're going to be talking about. And then John Hamm will be presenting, and we'll open it up to discussion, questions and answers, and, and get into it. Um, so first, I want to point out everyone should have this on their chair. It's the call to action of Refuse Fascism. It is our mission statement. It's an analysis of where we find ourselves in the advancing consolidation of a fascist regime in this country. It, 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 it is also uh, our, a statement of our basic strategy, which we will be discussing at much greater length here tonight. Uh, that the, the only way we are going to get out of the, under the thumb of this fascist regime, it's not gonna come through 2018 elections, let alone 2020 alone. It's not gonna come through, Mueller's not gonna come down and rescue us. It's gonna be on us, a different kind of protest. That's what uh, page three of the uh, call to action outlines, and that's what we're gonna get into much more. This is also an organizing tool. Everyone should leave with copies, take them out, get into it with people. You should be, if you have not already, go online to refusefascism.org and sign the call. Get on our list, become part of this movement. Everyone um, has a lot to contribute and everyone is needed. Uh, time is not on our side. Time is running short as, you probably uh, heard today the uh, Supreme Court decision that basically uh, upheld the right of a bakery to discriminate against a gay couple getting married. It's so outrageous. It's such an attack on um, what they call the public accommodations law, which was the law that dismantled Jim Crow, de jour discrimination, and now it's coming back under the guise of religious freedom, which as the call talks about, that's a particular American form of fascism, these Christian fascists, and the role that they have played in the consolidation of this regime. So um, the urgency uh, is, is clear, although we'll be getting into that too. So um, with that, I want to introduce Michelle Ponce de Leon. She is the first generation daughter of Mexican immigrants. Uh, she is a teacher, a, a bilingual teacher with her master's degree, and she's an activist with Refuse Fascism who has uh, been doing a lot of work with immigrant rights organizations. So, Michelle. Wow. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Good evening, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Michelle Idalia Ponce de Leon. We have an emergency in front of us. Um, some call it a constitutional crisis. Um, we're at a critical point where um, in our history and we must face and respond to it now or we will regret it because there may not be a way to fix it later. Um, the Trump and Pence regime is in fact a fascist regime that doesn't just re disrespect the planet and humanity. They are dismantling the people's ability to protect themselves from their authoritarian control. And we've been shocked from the beginning to the present with their outrageous actions and violations of the rule of law. This, normally, this normalizing strategy is um, used to establish um, a tyrannical government. Um, so they've been normalizing their racism, xenophobia, and humane attacks on immigrants, deporting dreamers, targeting leaders of immigrant rights groups, 
taking children away from their parents and housing them in um, military bases um, and militarizing the U.S.-Mexico border. You may have heard of Claudia Patricia Gomez Gonzalez. Um, she was a 20-something-year-old Guatemalan um, Mayan who left her home and her family to look for work in the United States like her uncle had done years ago. But she had no idea what the present situation was. She had no idea that now we have a draconian style uh, government and governing who is going to pretty much smash um, people crossing the border. So she got shot in the head um, just a couple of weeks after leaving her home. And um, someone filmed it, so they got it uh, on a, they taped it, they videoed it, and the, I think it was the grandmother or the mother um, while she was grieving, said to, the, to the, uh, someone who wrote an article about um, Claudia that she was very grateful to the person who videoed because she said otherwise she would, have, she would have just been another dead immigrant and no one would have known her name or known about her. So that's why I say her name loudly um, and clearly and, and entirely. Um, and so, again, I will say her name, Claudia Patricia Gomez Gonzalez. Um, and so please remember her name. <laughs> um, they've been normalizing their racism. Uh, I lost my place, I'm so sorry. Um, the Trump regime has uh, even attacked journalists saying they are the enemy of the people. Uh, they've been threatening the rule of law by meddling in the Department of Justice, pretty much questioning his own Department of Justice and meddling with, you know, and even, um, pretty much, I'm sorry, disregarding the, um, so they've disregarded the planet and the environment, the Environmental Protection Agency even removed the, um, the page where they um, talk about climate change um, from the website. They continue to threaten private citizens. Today, just as uh, Samantha um, B was being threatened and um, intimidated, um, and there's many that have been. So uh, today's Trump, today Trump, Trump's Supreme Court pressed a law that protects discrimination against gay people. And this is no surprise, right? It's no surprise anymore, it's become the norm. Um, but this is why refused fascism exists. And we need to learn from uh, South Korea how to get rid of a tyrant. And that's why we're all here today, thank you. And we must demand for the Trump and Pence regime to go in the name of humanity. Thank you. That was fine. So next, a video. We are horrified and angered at the shocking damage already done to lives here and around the world by the Trump-Pence regime. We recognize that they are poised to do far worse, including threatening war, even nuclear war. Through an unrelenting barrage of daily outrages and Twitter outbursts, the Trump-Pence regime is radically remaking society, step by step hammering into place a vicious American fascism. This is not insult or exaggeration. It is what they are doing. Therefore, we resolve that nothing short of removing this whole illegitimate regime from power will stop this nightmare. But how can we realistically oust this regime? Many are relying on the blue wave and democratic leadership to lead us out of this mess. But sadly, the opposition party has shown that they are not willing to stand up to the regime and are in fact complicit when they regularly seek common ground, when they insist that impeachment is off the table, and when they support all this regime's war moves. Also, there is no certainty that the Democrats can sweep the elections, as the fascists engage in even more gerrymandering and voter suppression, and Russia continues to meddle with impunity. So, relying on the blue wave will actually be a path to capitulation to fascism.
So what can we do? Refuse Fascism has a plan which has been tried by others and proven successful. There are three major examples from recent years, Armenia, South Korea, and Egypt. Each of these countries had its own particular political dynamics and challenges, but all three mass movements succeeded in their simple goal, to drive out an unpopular, illegitimate leader. At the beginning of 2011, Egypt's Hosni Mubarak was a military-backed dictator that had been in power for 30 years with support from the United States. But once the popular uprising began on January 25th, it took a mere 18 days of massive protests to get him out. It began with a call from various youth groups that spread online through social media. They turned a national holiday commemorating police forces into a day of rage protest against civil and human rights abuses. Demonstrations, marches, occupations, nonviolent civil disobedience, and general strikes took place in major cities all over the country for the next two weeks. Mubarak tried to hold on to power by dissolving the government and stating he would not run for re-election. He ordered a military crackdown of the protesters that resulted in 846 deaths and thousands of arrests. But the people persevered until finally, on February 11th, Mubarak resigned and was later sentenced to prison. After changing the structure of parliamentary leadership, Serge Sargian clung to power in Armenia by seizing a third consecutive term as head of the government. In response, a massive civil disobedience campaign to demand Sargian's resignation began in the capital on April 16th, despite repression by riot police and arrests of the opposition leaders, the protests continued to grow. On April 23rd, tens of thousands of people in a country of 2.9 million celebrated in the streets as Sargian announced his resignation. But the people weren't done yet. In May, when the ruling party refused to elect a prime minister, further demonstrations and a national strike brought the country to a standstill. This political crisis forced parliament to meet the demands of the people. As of May 8th, Opposition leader Nicole Pashinian is the new prime minister. Starting in October 2016, hundreds of thousands of people, families, students, workers, farmers, began to fill the streets of Seoul every day, refusing to stop until their corrupt president, Park Jenun Hai, resigned or was forced out. Many groups and sections of society came together and protests continued to grow. It was the largest protest since South Korea became a democracy nearly 30 years ago. For the third weekend in a row, South Koreans occupied the streets of central Seoul. The mass protest was organized by trade union activists, but attended by a diverse group, workers, students and families who started turning up in the early afternoon. The rally was peaceful, carnival-like even, but with the sense of anger and betrayal protesters have for President Park and hae I want my family members to be part of what could be an historic moment. We're here because we want Park and hae to hear the voice of the people. I believe the country's leadership is on the wrong path. We gave power to them, we're taking it back now. Park is accused of allowing a close friend inappropriate access to government documents and the potential to influence decision-making at the highest levels. The confidant, Che Soon Sil, is also alleged to have used her connections to enrich herself. She's being investigated by prosecutors. The protest culminated in a candlelight vigil and a coordinated and prolonged chant demanding the president's resignation. The protesters have in a sense won a symbolic victory. Just before the demonstration began, judges allowed protesters to march on this road. The presidential palace is just a kilometer away. It's the closest a demonstration of this size has ever been allowed to get to the president's office. 
This is the first rally all opposition parties joined since news of the scandal broke last month. Opposition politicians have stopped short of demanding the president resign. But they are demanding she allow an investigation led by a specially appointed prosecutor. They also want her to hand over power to a prime minister chosen by parliament. Park has tried to appease the people by reshuffling government leaders. She's also agreed to relinquish some powers to a prime minister of her choice. A compromise that appears to have pleased no one and has only served to intensify calls for her to step down. The opposition parties in the legislature initially refused to impeach President Park because, they said, there weren't grounds to do so. But the people persisted and continued holding massive protests, forcing the opposition parties to change their minds and find legitimate grounds for Park's impeachment. Even after being impeached, the president refused to resign and Together with the legislature, they proposed a number of schemes that would keep her in power. The South Korean people remained defiant, and with their eyes firmly on the prize, they continued to demand that she had to go. was ultimately removed from power when her impeachment was ratified in March of 2017 and is now serving a 24-year prison sentence for abuse of power. Ultimately, the Constitutional Court upheld Park's impeachment and a special election was held, with Moon Jae-in winning by the largest percentage for a liberal candidate since open elections have been held in South Korea. The world is waiting and watching us, hoping that we will rise to the occasion like the Armenians, Egyptians, and South Koreans did, that we will remove this tyrannical Trump-Pence regime from power and end this worldwide nightmare. As one South Korean said, soon we might be able to export candlelight vigils and the South Korean impeachment process. I hope the first country to import our candlelight vigils will be the United States. Is the Trump-Pence regime any more legitimate or less dangerous than these ousted regimes? When you look at the open white supremacy, the threats of fire and fury on the world, the vicious attacks on immigrants, the blatant lies, the heartless greed and corruption and the rage and disbelief of millions of people who do not want this. We have no less power. And even more importantly, we have the utmost responsibility to stop the fascists at the head of the most powerful military in the world. We cannot continue to lie to ourselves by believing that this is business as usual. We must wake up to the reality that if this regime continues down this path, the results will be even greater horrors for us and for the people around the world. If we do not step outside the normal channels and put justice before order, we will not stop the relentless nightmare this regime is inflicting on the world. Refuse fascism has a strategy 
and plan to end this nightmare. We are organizing now to launch massive, sustained, nonviolent protests in the streets of cities and towns across the country. Protests that continue day after day and don't stop, creating the kind of political situation in which the demand that the Trump-Pence regime be removed from power is met. What is needed is you. Which side will you be on? What will you do? No, in the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. Join us. John will be presenting some background for us. Uh, he taught for 17 years at Northside College Prep High School, a CPS school. Uh, where and 11 years before that at uh, Lane, Lane Tech and Kenwood Academy. That's right, Lane Tech. Go Lane Tech. Um, <laughs> um, where he uh, enjoyed bringing transcendentalism and the ph philosophies of uh, Ralph Waldo em Emerson and Thoreau into his English classes. He is a lifelong student of history, including that of nonviolent movements for social change and of the Korean Peninsula, where his family uh, comes from. So uh, thank you, John. Thank you. It's good to be here with you. We must be in dire straits if we're asking ourselves now what we can learn from the South Korean mass protests that eventually ousted, prosecuted, and jailed the autocratic and corrupt President Park Geun-hye. If we're talking about mobilizing hundreds of thousands of marchers to demonstrate every week, sending up thunderous cries for our president's resignation or impeachment, within earshot of the White House and legislative houses, as the South Koreans did from October 2016 to March 2017 in Seoul, then we are admitting that we, too, are a distressed democracy. Because if we were a stable and confident democracy, we would exert ourselves through our elected officials, appealing to our court systems, writing in our independent press, and we would have faith in the change that these institutions could affect. But in the Trump era, we may well be a distressed democratic society. We might, well, we might do well to learn from the South Koreans how long-lasting, constant, and very energetic civil disobedience can bring down a corrupt and unfit world leader like Park Geun-hye. Marchers coming from all walks of life, showing up after work, demonstrating late into the night, we learn from the South Korean model that smug, unresponsive elected officials in the conservative parties can turn a deaf ear to the people's will for just so long until they too are swept up in the fervor and are shamed, if not persuaded, to honor the people's will. Anti-Park demonstrators demanded from October 2016 that the parliament investigate Park's appointment of Choi uh, Sun Il, a personal friend of Park's, who was given extraordinary access to highly classified documents, even though she had no security clearance, no training in government, and no experience whatsoever in politics. Kind of makes you think of Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump, doesn't it? <laughs> and they demanded that the parliament begin impeachment hearings. But the uh, South Korean conservative lawmakers refused to even think about impeachment for quite a long time. They resisted it every step of the way. What do South Korea's mass demonstrations have to do with us? I mean. Haven't you heard a lot of arguments about, in the US about how protests and marches can never result in impeachment hearings and because the Republican House will never allow it? Only this, we can learn that a bully can be bullied. The South Koreans were not going to be browbeaten by smug conservative politicians. Their groundswell movement in the, in the streets of Seoul and Busan and other great South Korean cities Made, them, made everybody sit up and take notice, even the conservatives. 
and noticed that their own constituents were demanding that the lawmakers get up off their seats and act like public servants. But the conservative parliamentarians refused to talk about impeachment still, and President Park tried to appease everyone by firing some of her political officials and playing a kind of political musical chairs. The demonstrators and even Park's own party found this a laughable compromise. So lawmakers tried to appease the people by demanding Park turn over her power to a specially elected prime minister. Park said she'd appoint her own prime minister and turn over her power to him. The people in the streets said nothing doing. And they continued to demand that she resign or be impeached. On December 3rd, 2016, now let's remember, these demonstrations started back in October. On December 3rd, 2016, a whopping 2.3 million demonstrators marched in the boulevards and streets fronting the presidential palace and the parliament in Seoul alone. That same day, three opposition parties quickly drafted articles of impeachment against Park, and the motion was carried lickety-split. Six days later, the impeachment was passed by 234 vo votes to 66, far more than the two-thirds majority needed to pass such an act. Even 62 members of Park's own party voted to impeach her. The same conservative lawmakers who wouldn't even answer the calls of their constituents in October now found themselves jockeying for survival as Park's approval plummeted to 5%. What does that show us? It shows us that we don't have to wait and take directions from our lawmakers. They work for us. If we can demonstrate to them what our demands are, they will be politicians. They won't want to be unemployed guardians of an out of favor despot. But the courts wouldn't ratify or reject the, the impeachment vote until March. Now remember that the people in the street demanded that Park be removed from office and that a special election be held to replace her. And they demanded that she be brought to, tr to justice and prosecuted for her abuse of power. They were not relenting on those unmet demands just because the parliament voted to impeach Park. So the weekly anti-Park mega marches didn't end or get any smaller or quieter through January or February. In fact, they got a lot more intense. In January and February, more corrupt business and political practices came to light, strengthening the people's case for removing and replacing Park and her whole corrupt regime. And in March 2017, the courts ratified the impeachment articles and ordered President Park to step down. For a time, she refused. But on March 10th, she was impeached and removed physically from office. On March 9th, the day before, a special president, uh, presidential election was held and South Koreans voted for the liberal Moon Jae-in by the largest margin in some 30 years ever given to a liberal uh, Korean president. So the people's voice had, been move, had moved the, the, the lawmakers to carry out the people's will in South Korea in 2016, 2017. If the South Koreans had so much reason to oust their corrupt president by carrying their parliament on the backs of demonstrators, we Americans have even more need to do the very same thing. Park was impeached for corrupt business practices and political practices. But corrupt business practices are only one thread in the fabric of Trump's political and economic programs based on lies that cover up the special interests and strange alliances like those with Russia, which animate this administration's globally ruinous program. We cannot take two and a half more years of this as a country. But I want to point out something that we'd better remember if we talk about looking to the South Koreans for a model of a new way to voice our concerns. The South Koreans who took this to the streets in such phenomenal numbers in 2016 and 2017 may have looked like they were going to a picnic. They may have looked like happy, peaceful, friendly people. 
which in fact they were, but they were also very angry. And they were following an old and very grim tradition of civil disobedience that goes all the way back to March 1, 1919, when university students and professors, trade unionists and others, secretly organized a nationwide general strike that went across all professions from one end of Korea to the other and back up the other way. It involved all Koreans. Idealists, some of whom had read Thoreau's civil disobedience, took, up, took to heart what Thoreau said about the oppressive machine. Thoreau said that the oppressive machine of a corrupt government can only be stopped if we use our lives, our bodies, as a counter friction that will slow down and stop that oppressive machine. The Koreans in March 1, 1919 were willing to do that. The Japanese had been telling the world that they were there to modernize Korea and to help the Koreans get into the 20th century. The Koreans had to show the world that they were there, that the Japanese were there to exploit Korea, that they were being very cruelly treated, and that they were being denied the right to express their own cultural identity. They took to heart what Thoreau said about the oppressive machine that cannot oppose you intellectually or spiritually, cannot argue against your conscience, that your conscience is more sacred than anything else in the universe. They knew that the machine could only intimidate them by threatening physical pain and possibly death. But these Koreans were so oppressed, so angry, so tired, that they no longer feared the torture and the executions that the Japanese could inflict on them. Koreans of all stations in life resonated with this powerful re re revolution, and they joined it. They declared independence from Japan on that very day, and they paid a terrible price for it. Thousands of them were hunted down and hanged from lampposts as an example to all that they'd better not oppose the Japanese occupation. And from that day until their liberation in 1945, though, Koreans were galvanized and united in their dream of independence, in their commitment to be ruled by individual conscience and not by the fear of physical pain or death. And Koreans began to learn and teach each other psychological methods to resist torture. They knew they couldn't shut out the pain. They just wanted to find ways not to talk under the influence of that pain. After World War II, the autocratic rule of US-backed South Korean President Syngman Rhee was challenged in 1960 by long weeks of civil disobedience, not just by university people, but by everybody who simply wanted to live free of a government that was not of them and could not serve their interests. Once again, the tear gas, once again, the bullets, the jail cells. Many were imprisoned, tortured, many died. Again, the demonstrators resolved that they, as, as Thoreau said, would make their bodies the friction that slows and stops the machine. And they won out. President Rhee was deposed and replaced, and South Korea got just a little closer to being a real democracy. And in 1980 and 1987, there were other peaceful civil uprisings against former army generals who always tended to be elected president in South Korea. Again, more imprisonment of dissident voices, more violent put-downs of demonstrations, particularly in and around the universities. But here again, that steely resolve to rise above the rule of the iron-fisted autocrat into an atmosphere of free expression of beliefs, guarantees of human rights, and greater enfranchisement fortified these bona fide practitioners of civil disobedience. And their efforts brought them even closer to their democratic ideal. That is what we can learn from the South Korean street protests of 2016 and 2017. Not just their immediate success in actually removing a corrupt president despite the inaction of elected lawmakers, not just the way people made the lawmakers earn their positions of trust by this long, grim, but, but the long, grim process of building this culture of 
peaceful, effective resistance. We Americans have also developed this culture of nonviolent civil disobedience, and in fact, it is older than that tradition in Korea. We have practiced it since the Mexican War, since the war with Mexico, since the Civil War. We have practiced it in our civil rights struggles, especially in the late 1950s and through the late 1960s, but even afterward. We have witnessed it at the Standing Rock resistance to the Dakota Access Pipeline by the Lakota Nation and by all Americans who supported them. Whence comes this courage, this fortitude to resist hate and violence with love and peace? It comes from many sources. It comes from the teachings of Christ, which as Martin Luther King Jr. said in his letter from the Birmingham jail, enjoin us as Christians to oppose injustice everywhere if we are to have peace and justice anywhere. It comes from that old transcendental belief in the universal spirit of love and affirmation which truly rules the universe. Emerson says that when we leave aside our mean egotism with which the machine or the joint stock company displaces our individual conscience, then we become the transparent eyeball filled and suffused only with the universal spirit, God himself, and not with a spirit of selfishness. And when that happens, there is no longer any high or low, no close friend or distant acquaintance when we regard each other, because we realize we are all part or parcel of God, since all men's and women's beings are wholly suffused with the universal spirit. We Americans have this long tradition of insisting on a life lived by conscience and not by fear of a tyrannical overlord. We, like the South Koreans who overthrew foreign oppressors, Presidents Ri, Ro, Chun, and Park, and like the Indians who threw off the colonial yoke of Britain and every other people who have ever said no to encroaching fascism or enslavement, we can draw on our inner source, whether we call it transcendental universal spirit or atheistic French existentialism, or the God in our religions, our Abrahamic religions, or the principle of Satyagaha, the Hindu principle of Satyagaha, the spirit, that spirit has shown up in all effective civil disobedience movements. It is the spirit of the human will. Thank you. Um, while you're getting your questions together, I hope you've got lots of questions uh, to pose to our panelists. Uh, Great. Everybody. We need the young people. We are not reaching the young people. The average age in my little Evanston group is 70. So I am one of the younger members. And I, I'm not to put them down. And they're all very concerned, as concerned as everybody in the room. But we need to awaken the, the, the younger people. Now, I do have two children who are active, but those are just two out of the sea of millions of young people. So that's the first thing we need. And, and I, I agree with John. The only way I had envisioned when, we, when I joined my little group back in January, right after the inauguration. I said the only thing that's gonna work are general strikes across the country all the time. And I, I mean, I don't, I'm, my husband is ill, I'm the only one working my family. How do I organize this? But that's the only thing that's gonna work, is if we stop the country's business day after day after day. And, and, and I'll tell you why. First of all, just as John said, all the politicians wanna keep their jobs. Secondly, Trump is a bully. And I was, reading, I was reading a book. He gives in when confronted by Will. If everybody shows a, a, a tough Will, he backtracks. The, the, um, who was it? Uh, on The Apprentice, the producer on The Apprentice, he wanted a million dollars the second season. Mm -hmm. And the producer said, we're only going to give you $60,000. He backtracked out. 
If he see today with the Eagles, some Eagles refuse to go. He disinvited them. He backs down. If we present a united front day after day, week after week, he will lead. He will lead. Because nothing, nothing bothers him more than to be humiliated. So I, I think that's the only way to do this. I don't know how to do this, but I've been saying since the beginning, it has to be across the country, every town or every city, every town, everybody, all the time for weeks and weeks. You've, you've found a home. Welcome. Thank you. There, there are real questions that hold people back. That's why we presented, that's why we made this slideshow. People have a hard time imagining something beyond politics as usual. It's not just Trump backing down. We have the same problem that the people in South Korea had, where the liberals, the so-called opposition, refused to take action. And, and people way too much weighed down by that. That's why we're doing this program to address some of those questions. It's also why anyone here today or anyone listening to the, watching this on CAN TV, we are available to have this show, this slideshow, have the discussion at whatever resistance group you're in, what your faith congregation, your school. Uh, this is uh, the premiere of what we hope will be a, a, a road show. So to, to answer people's questions, let's, let's get some. OK. Um, I, I want to talk about fascism a little bit, because I think that that's something that, um, I mean, I have my own opinions about it, but I think that's something that is unique to our situation here. And you know, for the people in South Korea, my understanding is that the president was very corrupt and free. And, than like her 5% approval ratings. I mean, Trump, apparently he hasn't even gotten that low. Um, but you know, we have we have this white supremacy, we have support for you know the actions that he's taking, you know, that Michelle was describing, um, you know, from millions of people in this country. You know, there's these angry, you know, resentful white people who support whatever he does. You know, he said he could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and he wouldn't lose any support. And I think that that's true mm. for today as well, for his case. Really and and, and I think not, that, that that weighs on people. So I wanted to find out, you know, sort of how you feel that, you know, we can learn from this heroic example in South Korea, but also, you know, thinking about the specific, the sort of fear factor almost, you know, that we're dealing with. We could take a couple of questions and then add them up. Um, <coughs> Just a couple of things. One thing that you, for, you probably also believe is that the, the other factor with needing to shut down the business of this country is that this whole regime is backed by a bunch of oligarchs. This, See, that's, this goes that's, way that's, deeper that, than that. Trump. That's, that's the key. That's how the boycott worked in Montgomery because the bus boycott. You're absolutely yeah, right. So we, they, we they're losing to, their bus. We have, to make, we have to make the Koch brothers, the Mercers, Correct. who nobody Correct. ever talks about anymore, we have to make Correct. them all fear losing what they have and, and to understand that they don't have the power that they they have, that Correct. we can take it back. That's that's one thing. I agree. The other thing, like what you said, that I, I have kind of the same fears. I mean. Maybe what's different from a smaller country and a more cohesive country, if that's even true, and it's not. But we have this city versus country, we have this heartland that sounds to everybody like a good thing, but to me, heartland has always been scary. Who's heartland are we really talking about? Exactly, here? exactly. And I know it's not the same as a person of color, but I, I grew up as you know, the one little Jewish family in the heartland, and there were some of them. But some it's not, it's not model. It's no, 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 but, but what I'm trying, trying to here. say is they like this fascism that's going on. So yeah. how, how can we make them understand that it's not in their best interest, and how can we How, how can we make it work from like, I, I heard you say that this was driven, although it was joined, but it was driven by organized labor. Our organized labor is being decimated. Where are the unions? I don't see that them driving this 
and like they would have years ago in the 1920s or, you know, I, I, we have to find a way to get everybody out of the street and I think that we might not be able to do it the same way South Korea has and also because we have this dysfunctional two-party system versus a parliamentary system, I wonder how we can influence, force our particular governmental system. Like, we can't force a special, we don't have a mechanism for special election the way a parliamentary system does in the same way. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of layers to this, and I think that the talk of the, the spirit and the will to do it is fabulous, but we've got these other elements that we have to address so we can get ourselves out there. The element you brought up and the element you brought up. I really like your question, and I really like the concern you brought up also. Uh, <clears throat> as far as how we can't follow uh, the Koreans culturally for uh, their ability to, to organize such massive demonstrations. It's not easy for the Koreans either. You know, the Koreans, if you get two Koreans together, they'll have three opinions about, about anything. Well, I guess we're, we must be re related. The lost tribe. Yeah. <laughs> But the more we and groups like us get together and grow, the more we and groups like us talk it over. Our shared intelligence, our shared creativity, our shared reading, our shared insights and shared convictions will synergistically take over and we will find a way. Now, what we can do, I know it may have all sounded very abstract, but I do believe that what we can do is never lose faith that we can do this. We are going to do this. It's going to happen. I like the point you made about the economic resistance against Trump. Remember that David Hogg, a student from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in, in Parkland, Florida, was insulted by somebody on the air, uh, somebody on Fox News. I forget her name. Laura Ingram. And he promptly set about dismantling her whole sponsorship base. I think she lost more than half her sponsors. Yeah. Great. And I think it's still happening. Pick on somebody with a real sense of conviction. Pick on somebody with a real conscience. And you've got a fight on your hands. That's what we've got to do. A um, couple of things. Uh, you know, one of the things I think was clear from the video, you know, the whole point about how uh, not all, everybody was saying, the news media and everything, that she wouldn't be impeached, that she was going to stay there. This has been true of every mass uprising. It's the 50th anniversary of France, 1968. And right before then, everybody was saying, oh, the French are too bored and too this, too that, the French young people, blah, blah, blah. They won't do anything, and boom. And so I think we should under understand that. And that was true in South Korea, even with their long tradition. I also just wanted, and Charlie, we should comment on this too. There were forces that came together in the uprisings in 2016 that had been organizing for a while. One was students, and I think the Iwo College protests, where um, they had a, a protest where the president called 1,600 police on 200 students, and there were pictures of these young girls singing, being dragged out by police, it was so outrageous, it outraged South Koreans, and then students and journalists and everybody started investigating, and that's how the whole scandal that became grist for the protest drove her out. The role of students, very important. Another important force, and you're talking about Stoneman Douglas, 
that it reminded me of was the Sewell Ferry disaster families that President Park was considered, her neglect was considered responsible for a ferry disaster where 300 people, 250 of them, high school kids, drowned. The families never gave up. That was what, 2014? Yes. And they kept organizing. When the scandal came out about President Park, they jumped into action. So, and I think, you know, to me this was like, we should really pay attention to, and be part of, as we have been, all these people around the, the you know, gun control, with whatever differences, that's an important movement. So, I just think, you know, that, um, that we, we should think about, you know, the depth, I think, that they around immigrants, of all the different forces that have reasons to hate this regime and work among them and bring them together. But also, you can't judge the potential just from what you're looking at at yeah. any given moment. It's what's under, what's underneath. That's, That's very well said. And I, I, I want to I entirely agree with you on the Seoul um, investigation, the, uh, the ferry boat that sank. On the day that President Park was called on to ask to answer questions about that, she was not anywhere to be found. She was just she just disappeared. We tend to think we can't we can't surmount this kind of smugness. We tend to think we cannot we cannot fight this kind of unresponsiveness. We can. When enough of us see what happened, when enough of us are struck by the undeniable ugliness of this corruption, we take over. We don't wait for their response. We let them know. We take the initiative. And the ball is in our court. It becomes our game and not theirs. Yeah. A absolutely. I would just add that's what we are trying to do with Refuse Fascism, working with allies, working with other resistance uh, movements and organizations to get to the point, as it says, we, we're organizing now for the time when we can launch massive, sustained, nonviolent protests in the streets. And what will be that time? We don't know. That's exactly your, I think, your point. It could be Mueller's firing. Not just to go out in the street and protest, but to go out in the street day after day after day and call people out to join us. It could be the ICE uh, knocking down doors and shooting people. That could be the, what's going to snap it. But the, the separating families, that's exactly the point. Every day there is another outrage, there is another cause for this movement to advance and grow. If we're doing the work to answer the questions, to connect the dots, still people, too many people are very active against one outrage or the other, but they don't see the big picture. People don't know, even people who are active and indivisible or whatever, move on, don't know what's happening to other sections of the people. And that's where refuse fascism has to be helping to connect the dots in the organizations. And we will get to some more questions. Okay. I, um, when I was listening to you, I really appreciate your words of encouragement because it is very discouraging sometimes when you're out there trying to unite organizations that are um, immigrant advocates and they've been out there for years and we come along and we're trying to unite with them and they are kind of used to doing their own thing their way and it's been a struggle. Um, so yes, we, I don't feel that we have that energy that we had in the 60s or 70s and I feel that it's just been so, so hard right now with everyone busy with their work and they're doing what they're doing. I don't think they understand how um, this is really fascism. A lot of people don't really believe it is, and so they think, oh, the next election. Plus, I wanted to say that, um, what was I gonna say, about how 
we are uniting with organizations gradually, and if anybody here is interested in joining us, we need all the support we can get so that when we actually call, um, this is urgent, we need to get out on the streets. We need you to be there for us, um, with us, so, but I know we have other questions. Yeah, well, I, I wondered if you could say more about the economic core, because until we have a general strike in the country, we need allies, and you brought that up, I, you know, to really paralyze this city and the nation. You need bus drivers unions, you need uh, patrolmen's unions, hey, there's an idea. But you need, you need those unions behind you to paralyze, to paralyze the economy and bring people to their feet, and they get tired of it. I hope that's not my call, and that would be terrible, but uh, say more about the State of the Unions when Mrs. Park was removed. Say more about the state, let's face it, of the stock market and how fearful they are of that kind of crisis and want to get back to normalcy and to serve their own interests. They want to get back. More about the economic core behind this and how do we tweak it to cause chaos in the streets. Not that it can't be done because well, 1968, I think of Prague stopping tanks. I think of what you said about France mobilizing with strong union backing. Uh, I think of Grant Park right here 50 years ago. It can be done, but I don't want students in the vanguard saying, well, they're all on spring break, they're on summer break, they have the time to do this. I want to see linking with trade unions saying, Today it's the buses, the CTA is down, tomorrow it's the train. And, and people get tired of this, and why? How can we put stability back in our economy? We get rid of the number one cause. So, speak more to the economics of it. Thank you. I'm not an economics teacher, but I've done some reading and thinking about this. And also, I've done some living. Um, the Chicago Teachers Union, to which I proudly belonged, um, launched the biggest strike Chicago had seen in 2012. I think it was something like 25,000 people took to the streets. Not only were teachers involved with that, I mean, not only were there some 25,000 teachers here, I saw the SEIU joining in with us, other, other, other unions joined in with us. There is, there is an underpinning of, of, of unionism. It's, it's under attack, but it's still there and it's fighting back. Um, that union, that teachers union um, that launched such a huge uh, strike in 2012 was at the time under a lot of union busting efforts by our mayor. And it still put this together. In fact, the, maybe the more unions are under attack, the stronger they will be. Uh, I, I wanted to talk about a few other things. I, I liked your question about how do we win over some of these people who are so entrenched in their pro-Trumpist ideas don't see the contradictions of, 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 their, of their loyalties to a guy who's really not serving their interests, is working against their interests. But they don't see that, they don't want to see that. A, a lot of them don't, but a lot of them are coming to. There are, there are lots of stories you'll run into about people who are saying, boy, did I screw up voting for, for Donald Trump. Yeah. That's right, so we cannot answer their hate with our hate. It's okay for us to be angry, but we've got to be intelligently angry, not at them, but at, at the contradictions they're not seeing. And I'm not saying I have all the answers. I don't know how to talk to a Trump supporter. I'd hate to have to talk to one over a Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> but I'll have to find a way. Um, 
I, I would just like to caution. I don't think we can approach this with some formula in mind. It has to be this group or that group or the other group because you can cite the opposite in the history of this country. Uh, the massive uh, civil disobedience movements that demolished uh, Jim Crow and uh, de jure segregation. Uh, uh, those were not unions, okay? Uh, there, were, there were breaks within the union, and, and I think we, that brings the question of the Democratic Party leadership. As we talk in here, they are not going to lead us out of this. Uh, much of the union establishment is very tightly wound up with the Democratic Party leadership, and there's going to have to be splits in that, in those, uh, in those ranks. And I, I think some of that you can almost see it already with with some of the union locals that are more active in the streets, and the the leadership is dramatically silent. I mean, disgustingly silent about what's going on. So I think this is one of the cases, you'd almost have to put the union leadership up there with the Democratic Party leadership. Those are the people who, um, those in power who themselves now are under attack by the regime, but conciliating with it would be compelled by our sustained protest to respond to our struggle from below leading to a situation where this illegitimate regime is removed from power. That's what's projected in, the, that's our strategy in the call to action. And I think that that is uh, what we've learned from history. That's what happened in, in South Korea. Not that it's the same lineup in the streets there that we're gonna start with, but that by our persistence and our determination and our clarity of what we're demanding, that'll cause those internal rifts to widen out and some people to, to stand up for principle because the danger becomes clear every day. That's the other side of it, right, is what's the necessity? organizations, and a lot of it was very informal. A lot of it came from good old teachers, scholars, students, um, poets, writers, artists. There have always been very well-read people in, in Korea. Marx was translated into Korean in the, in the 1800s. And so, Yeah, there's a very strong uh, Christian faith community. Uh, there are Buddhists, Confucianists uh, in Korea, and there are a lot of, in South Korea, there are a lot of Methodists, a lot of Protestants. And was that a part of it too, or was yeah. it more like academics and artists? It was across the, bro the board, brother. It was everybody. Farmers. Yeah. Farmers, yeah, I was, yeah. Well, you know, the, uh, the crueler, the more blatantly racist and insulting and cruel a, a, an occupying power is, the stupider it is. Because they made it, they, made it, they made it that much easier for the Koreans, who are a bunch of people who never agree with, any, with, with, with each other ever to agree with each other on one thing. They had to get rid of the Japanese. Um, it gets a lot subtler when you come across Nazis and fascists 
who can make change happen so gradually that you don't realize you're in trouble until you're the last guy they're picking on and there's nobody else to help you out. Because you didn't help, you didn't help anybody else they were picking on. They'll pick on one group after another and you'll think, well, that's got nothing to do with me. It's, it's very insidious. I was just wondering, I saw the, the picture of all the people in the street. I visualize the United States, the cannons, the tear gas, the shootings, the beatings. And happened in the South. Okay, because in the 1960s. And so But I didn't see it now. No, I'm not talking about in Korea. I didn't see, you know, those people oh, in the street. Oh, yeah. And, and, and that's a good question. Why didn't it happen this time? Well, remember that 1,600 of them did pick on 200 schoolgirls. And that's what disgusted all the rest of the Korean nation. Um, I, I think that when we get into this age of rapid communication and everybody sees what's going on, a dictator thinks twice about doing something stupid, like, like sicking his... his Stormtroopers on, on unarmed people. The cops in the United States don't seem to feel that. They don't care if they're photographed and tanked in color. We can ask, ask to it. Uh, since we're getting inspiration from the uh, South Korean uh, protests, who, by the way, if I may interrupt, who drew their inspiration from us? Uh, well, you know, you hope it goes backwards and forwards. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I just uh, had proposed this one time before that uh, since the South Koreans uh, eventually did get a special election uh, order, it wasn't really part of what it began as being what the protests were for, and it isn't necessarily something that uh, comes naturally out of their constitution, but you know, it doesn't come out of ours, but can that be one of the asks that we make when we eventually get to that large demonstration in the streets? Speaking only as a private citizen, you betcha. I, 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 I think we're going to have to demand that. I don't think we can wait till 2020 to replace Donald Trump. He's, he's doing too much damage as it is right now, and, and it's not going to be enough to get rid of him. We've got to replace him and his whole, his whole cohort with people who who, who we're really out to defend the Constitution, really out to defend our democracy. Are there people who haven't spoken yet who wanted you? Okay. <laughs> new people, new faces. I'm Reginald Sawyer. I'm the president of the Chicago Two Spirit Society. We are an organization of, of LGBT gay indigenous uh, a, a, a group that's, uh, the, that, that is devoted to being a support group to our LGBT uh, indigenous people in the closet, and uh, 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 we stand in solidarity with Fuse Fascism and our uh, Revolution Club. Now, one thing I do want to point out is that, and I'm glad you mentioned about uh, about uh, uh, about uh, 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 Saturday Rock. Not only was it uh, uh, was all uh, when it came to all five Native American people uniting. There was also a Two Spirit camp there at Staten Rock mm -hmm. that was there that, that was there to be a part of the that was automatically a part of the uh, 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 of the uh, of the protests. But also, to let us not forget, this year is the 49th annual anniversary of Stonewall. Next year is the 50th anniversary. Stonewall did not happen with no union of uh, 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 it, it, it was uh, activists like like us. Activists like us, gay indigenous a a a a activists like me. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 it was black, white, blue, purple, and of course, straight people were involved in Stonewall too. So you straight people are part of Stonewall too. You got arrested and thrown in jail with the rest of us by those cops. But remember too that you can't think about these other revolutions without looking at Stonewall, where we all had to come together and fight these oppressors. And it's gonna take all of us to come together, the young, the old, gay, straight, all of us. So my question to you is, 
like it's like you had mentioned in, in Korea, it took all the Korean people to come together. Just like in our Native American culture, it took us gay Native Americans along with all of our Native American people in Standard Rock to fight this oil, uh, to fight this oil pipeline. Did the same fall for uh, Korea when the Koreans uh, came to throw uh, 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 the corrupt President Park out of uh, office? Yeah, I think they're pretty uniformly opposed to the kind of uh, the way self-enrichment had woven itself into the into the governmental culture in, in South Korea. It, the, the whole rotten system became so abhor abhorrent to all Koreans that they united on that. I, I just want to say thank you for what you just shared with us. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we have to oppose injustice everywhere if we're going to have justice and peace anywhere. It is not just our, our chosen few garden variety issues that we're going to invest in. We have to oppose Trump's attacks on us, on all of us, wherever we find them. We'll have to, we'll have to ally ourselves with the LGBT uh, movement because Trump and his people are, are attacking them. And look at today's Supreme Court decision, right. where, they, where, where uh, Trump, the right. Trump and his administration interfered with the Supreme Court's decision to rule in favor of that Christian fascist banker who, who mistreated that gay, that gay couple and refused to make a cake for them. All because they claimed that, uh, 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 that the commission, the Colorado the, 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 the Commission, Refused uh, had to infringe on their religious uh, on his religious rights and his religious beliefs, which is unfortunate. Yeah, we're going to have to we're going to have to align ourselves with all humanist movements, and not just make stovepipes out of our movement. We've got to we've got to address all of these issues. You're not going to find Donald Trump saying, "Well, I'm against LGBTQ people." But I, yeah, yeah. But, but, but I sure like Mexicans, or but I sure like Asians. No, he doesn't like anybody. He doesn't. He doesn't like women. Yeah. So we're going to have to we're going to have to stand up to him everywhere. He assaults us. Whenever he assaults any of our human family. Uh, one person has. I was reading a uh, few days ago the article um, from uh, reviews that was talking about um, King Louis because I can't pronounce the French, but I am the state, and the state is me. Right? And so, and that's basically what Trump is saying. And through Giuliani, he's saying all of these things. Well, he could pardon himself. He can't. He can't be. You couldn't even indict him for murder because he's above the law. I mean, I don't know if he wants to be a king or God, but yes. all of this, yeah, right. All of this. Plus, you're talking about economic. You know, um, you know, too much money is going into the pockets. I mean, every time this man goes to Florida, the Secret Service has to rent golf uh, carts <laughs> from him, and he charges them like $10,000, I don't know $150,000 <laughs> per weekend. How many weekends has it been up yet? I don't understand why more people aren't enraged about these things. They're not a secret. I mean, it, these things are not a secret. Remember, there's, there, I mean, every child knows that there's three. And now they've been supporting Roseanne. There's three, there's three parts of our government, right? And they're all supposed to check and balance each other, the executive, the, ju the whatever they are. And <laughs> I'm too upset to talk about it. Yeah. And it's like, it's like now everything is him and nobody else counts and everybody just c capitulates. And it's like, are we the only people who see this? No. I don't understand why no. more people aren't coming no. to things and saying, my God, this is crazy. Please don't be discouraged. I, I understand how you feel. I, I know that it looks that way. But please know that's not how it is. 
and that's not how it's going to end up. People don't know about this movement. People don't know that there's another way to drive out this regime. People think all they hear is, uh, sign this petition online, call your member of Congress, uh, before this bill or that bill, donate to this uh, Democratic candidate, blue wave, that is all you hear constantly. I, I mean, who doesn't have a dozen of those emails every morning when they wake up, right? Who knows about refused fascism? Way too many people. We find people every day who are fed up with waiting for some blue wave that only puts people in power who give Trump more power, who collaborate, who, who pass the surveillance bill. That couldn't have passed without the Democrats, okay? Who, the, the, the bill that gutted Dod Dodd-Frank could not have passed without the Democrats. This is what, and yet that is what people think is all that's available. And that's why we made that uh, request for donations. People are not gonna find out about this movement without all of us throwing in everything that they can, whether that's taking copies of the call, having a discussion with your neighbors, your, in your church group, absolutely, your union local. It, that's what it's gonna take because we know, we know that there are people, millions of people who are horrified, but what's the, what's the way out? That's a question. In the back, you, you had your hand up. Uh, well, look, if people are talking, kind of look at uh, the, the anatomy of US society and what are different forces doing. Lena talked about this, the, the white supremacist social base of Trump and this Trump camp. And they are, they're getting more greed, more organized, and, and, and the, climate in this society with the, with the ethnic cleansing, with the, the open racism, animals, all of that is feeding it. Someone raised about the youth, where are they? Good, good question, and that's got to change. Everybody People talked that. about organized labor, which hasn't been. But there, one of the things that's missing is there's millions of people that have been out in the street, but right now it's a situation in America where as William Butler Yeats put poetically, the worst are filled with passion and intensity and their best laugh all conviction. But that's not, I, I, I really like that description of the history of resolve and all that, but that's very current. It's very much based in the, in the political climate of this country, especially the fact that, that these millions who have been out in the streets, and it wasn't only a few years ago, many hundreds of thousands went out against murdering police. The Women's March, this is their, what, what is this, what is statistics? Something like one in four Americans have protested in the last? One in six, one in six. Okay, that's very significant. But people are being pacified by the things that Jay was talking about. That's what's missing. That's what's missing in this, in this anatomy and social dynamics is those millions have to be challenged to get the hell out there and stop waiting for the blue wave. But there is a lack of, it's not, there's not discontent and great fear. You can feel the ripple of fear when Trump goes on and says, I can basically go out, once again, go out and shoot, you know, shoot the, uh, James Comey. Yeah, James Comey, get away with it. And then this ghoul Giuliani goes out there and basically says he can get away with it, it would be legal. But I, what I'm trying to, is, is exactly the question of the missing element here. And it's not easy, it's not without risk in terms of people going out in the streets, but, it, but there is a basis out there. We gotta be fighting for it, exactly, yes. This, yeah. the, this <laughs> we should get back to the first two. Okay, go for it. We have a great tool. It's called social media. Yep. And we didn't have that 100 or 200 years ago. No. We need to be using that every day. And why? And I wanted to address about the monolithic. That heartland is not too monolithic. So I, I'm an interpreter. I do a lot of social security in the little towns where people voted for Trump. And I will say this that monolith is cracking. There's how do you talk to a Trump person? You sit down and you listen to them. You don't come at them and say, why did you vote? Are you happy with what's going on? They are not happy. Many of them are suffering now. You engage them in a conversation because they're not all racist. Ready to vote for Trump. But they're not all racist. They're not all mm -hmm. awful people. Many of them are ordinary people who voted for lots of different reasons for this man. Sure yeah, I think, I think it's, it's that Trump base is cracking. When this tariff war really gets rolling, a lot of American soybean farmers are gonna turn against them. A lot of hog farmers are gonna turn against them. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's right. 
Um, so you're going to find a lot more people going on Facebook and saying, boy, did I screw up voting for Donald Trump. And I want to say something else. There is nobody more dangerous to a demagogue than some foolish true believer in that demagogue when he gets disillusioned. Because watch out when he finds out he's been, he's been played. Um, we have a new hand up here, then we'll get back to you. <laughs> uh, I wanted to, this is for John, but I wanted, if you wondered if you could explore a little more a dynamic that I think we'll face, right? We don't know what the triggers will be. We may already have some in brewing right now. We don't know, we have to prepare for it. Uh, don't think we're going to rely on the, you know, wait for politicians or the Democrats or even some reluctant unions to come along. We have to create the conditions where they are forced to, to get with our program, if you want to put it sort of crudely. I want to know what happens when we have these people in the street and you talked about it how in South Korea, how they, they tried all kinds of ways to keep that person in power, right? The demand here is to drive out the Trump Pence regime, not Trump, but the regime. So that means there's yeah, gonna be a lot it. of uh, bait and switch kinds of things that are thrown at people. And if you could, if you have some insight into the dynamic in Korea, what kept, how did, you know, people work their way through all of these, you know, <laughs> candy bars that were thrown at them uh, in the attempt to get people to go home. Mm. How were they not diverted from their original purpose? Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> I can speak with absolute authority on one thing. Koreans, because I am one, Koreans are very stubborn people. Yes, like some Native Americans. Yeah. <laughs> Once you piss them off, you're in trouble. Uh, I, I, that's a very simplistic answer. Uh, people don't like being played. People, after a while of being played, can recognize what's all the confetti, what's all the What's all the candy bars, as you say? And they feel insulted when these come up again. They want answers. They want resolution to questions that they're genuinely wanting answered. I mean, they're, they're not going to settle for anything less. That's true in this country. That's true in every country. I'm sorry if this sounds very general, but you can follow up with a, another probing question and I'll do, do my best. Just briefly to that, I think from all of our experience over decades, the, the good part of being some el older people here, I can imagine uh, with pretty good certainty that there was a lot of argument and debate in those streets every time uh, that the, the opposition parties came up with, well, here you go, we're here listening to you, take this, we're gonna reshuffle the cabinet, we'll impeach her, but we'll leave her in power. Didn't you want her to be impeached? See, here you go. That, that it took, that there was leadership involved there. There were people who were clear and stubborn because they knew they had to get to the source to stop the problem. And that I think we can, we can anticipate that here. It was the case, in the, the, the big movement to, uh, coming out of Ferguson. Every time there was a counterattack, it raised more questions, more struggle, more um, debate about what is the way forward. And is this really a solution or is this a distraction? Is this confetti? We're, that, that's gonna have to, we have to anticipate that. And that's why, again, what Refuse Fascism is doing is so important. It can't only be outrage and, and disdain and hatred for the attacks, you have to understand where they're coming from, the fascist nature of this regime, who are your friends, and who are the capitulators, the nor who's normalizing, accommodating, and collaborating. And that's gonna be a moving target. 
Um, I wanted to say something too. I think for me, I see it as a lot more challenging. I know that we can do it. I know we can do it. But our challenge is to get everyone to wake up and just get out there because what I'm worried about is we have someone who is actually supported by um, Christian fundamentalists who are steering the policies that, are, that they are changing gradually while we're waiting to get together. And so every day, not only have they been attacking human beings and locking them up and, um, you know, profiting from keeping them in, in jails and separating their families and demonizing and criminalizing them just like Hitler did. So we have more of a Hitler than I think a park. Um, so it's really, really challenging. Um, I mean, I started by saying we have an emergency on our hands and we really do, we really do. I know it sounds like I'm being a, a bit extreme, but we really do, and the reason we do is because every day that we're waiting, they are changing policies that are affecting everybody, <laughs> everybody. I mean, the Constitution, um, beginning with the First Amendment when they decided to ban Muslims. I mean, the First Amendment is about you can't prefer one religion over the other. The government cannot prefer one religion over the other. But now, um, he has a whole organization helping him called the Congre Congressional Prayer Caucus Alliance that are steering, you know, they are the ones that are now wanting to have the whole in God we trust um, being everywhere in public schools. And there's not going to be a separation of church and state, according to what I read today. Um, so I think, I mean, I know I'm always bringing up The Guardian, but I, every time I open up, start first thing in the, okay, The Guardian, oh my God, this is happening. But yes, so that's what they're doing. And um, we're shocked every day. And they're changing policies every day. We know what happened today with the um, against um, the LGBTQ. So, yes. so all of that we see it happening. And while we keep waiting and thinking about you know how we're going to do this, we don't have time. We need to get out there. We need to get out there like right away and gather as many people. We need to convince people that this is urgent. So we need all the support. When people come here, I keep, you know, I'm hoping that you're here to go back and bring other people into this conversation and get people that you know you can talk um, into getting on. Uh, I know it sounds like I'm selling the uh, refused fascism, but we talk about this. We've been talking about I actually joined when I was fed up as a CPS teacher and quit my job in December and was really feeling down in the dumps, and then I, Tina, my friend, invited me to a meeting. She mentioned that people were saying, oh, they're not fascists, they're not fascists. And I said, oh, yes, they are. And she said, well, come to one of the meetings. And I said, okay. And so I did, and I'm now trying to wake everyone up. We're trying to wake everyone up. So if you can wake people up, help us use everything you've been talking about. Okay. We're gonna, just a, just a couple more, if people make short comments, okay? I haven't cut anybody off, but let's make it short because we do, we're running out of time here. Uh, one, two, three. Go. Uh, okay, I just want to reiterate that scene where you saw the huge, massive crowd. If I were an oligarch in power, I'd be afraid of that. We have to, we have to do protests that aren't like Disneyland protests where, where we're not just walking to Trump Tower and going mm -hmm, mm -hmm, with funny signs. <laughs> they have to be afraid. The, the people behind them have to be afraid. The Supreme, the, the PAC, the Supreme Court, has to start being afraid of their decision to turn the anti, the horrible decision they made into some sort of like, oh, we're protecting this man's religious freedom. The, the, the toxic yeah. turbiness. And, and I just, that's what I want to ask is how can we get there? Yeah, and my question is kind of related to that too. And um, I was just wondering, sort of tactically, on this question of nonviolence, you know, if you could talk just a couple minutes about how important that is, you know, both to what happens on Korea and, and to what we're trying to do here. And it, part of why I was wondering about this is because, like, when you think about the Stonewall and you know, how righteous as that was, I don't think that's the model, you know, for what we're trying to do here. We're not going to scare them through throwing fists. You know, we're going to go to the Cook Brothers' house. 
we're going to need to put our bodies on the line and potentially get hurt ourselves, you know? But I think that um, the reason that they're gonna be afraid of us is because there's millions of us. And they know that they hate, you know, that, that Trump's hated. But so, how, you know, I would just throw that to go out in the street. Behind yeah. Them. Okay, John, and then we'll take you two, and then we'll... I was thinking about that. I was thinking about how Northerners, white Northerners, would go south during the civil uh, civil you know disobedience in the uh, in the Jim Crow South to to ally themselves with the voter registration folks down there. They put themselves in harm's way, um, and you know we were talking about Martin Luther King a little uh, Martin Luther King Jr. a little while ago. He purposely looked for the triggers. He purposely looked for the places where he knew real, real Southern or, or, or white American supremacist, uh, fascist, whatever you want to call them. He looked for the, the points where they just, they just would not stand by. They would, they would be their very worst selves. He wanted to expose that. He wanted to expose also um, police brutality like with uh, Sheriff Bull Connor. Um, and he made sure that the world saw what these people were like when he, when he did expose them. They were undoing themselves when they, when they, when they did their worst. Um, Thoreau, Emerson, King all said that there is a silver cord of honesty in your heart, which when plucked will resonate with a similar cord in everybody else's hearts, even the hearts of those who are trying to oppress you. In the South, there were many policemen who refused to show up for duty the next day. They couldn't do this anymore. They called it the blue flu. They, they couldn't do this anymore. In India, there were Indian colonial police who refused to beat up the Indian uh, nationalist uh, anymore because it made them sick what they were doing. Imagine what it would be like to break your staff over a, a peaceful resistor and have him pick up the pieces and hand them to you and say, I believe this belongs to you. Wow. Which, then that happened. These people would realize they were doing what they were doing because they were being paid to do it. Nobody was paying these demonstrators to take a beating over the head. And after a while, people get sick of the contradictions in their own actions. They do. Some people will. Um, quick. One, two. I'll be kind of quick. Um, there was a really interesting article that um, Chrissy sent me from Quartz Media by a, a South Korean analyzing sort of the difference between South Korea and the U.S. And she said, for the most part, Koreans strongly distrust their leaders and institutions, which is why they rely so heavily on protests above all other forms of democratic action. And then she says, the fact that most Americans don't or won't engage in endless street protests is a sign of still healthy faith in institutions. Mm -hmm. And to me, that sort of, I don't know, our work cut out for us. It did make it clear, you know, to me it underlined how we have to persevere both in protest and things like this, and things like Bob Abadian's film that really exposed the system. And by the way, it's being shown uh, on uh, Sunday at 2.35, South Bay Street, and that's, I think, University Center. Anyway, but that people have to see through these institutions. They have to see the real nature, and that is an important part of what well, yeah, uh, just quickly, that 
in the next 30 to 90 days, we, we have a couple opportunities for nonviolent organized protests. I, I won't stop them if someone wants to be more violent, but uh, <laughs> You know, it can be bring a trade unionist, it can be bring a pot and pan, someone, you know, like in Chile with pot and pan. But that's called, it's 4th of July has been raised, and Labor Day. Two opportunities. If we're not there, shame on us. If we're there waving or clapping from the sidewalk, shame on us. Those are the two opportunities to bring out hundreds. If they happen to come and overshadow the marchers, the high school band, then, uh, then people have spoken. Very good. I, I just want to bring up, I, I, we cannot close this without talking about the fact that um, the new president of South Korea has played such a pivotal role in uh, attempting to bring the, the divided country back together again. And that in doing that, he is, um, I think, objectively going up against uh, Trump's uh, fire and fury threats that he has repeated um, to destroy a whole country of 26 million people. Um, and I just wonder how um, that is a backup. I think that when we're looking at, at triggers, what might cause the people to go into the streets, and what we need to argue is the occasion to go into the streets, that has to be a big one. This refuse fascism is we are organizing in the name of humanity. It's not about what's good for us here only. This is because Trump is a threat to humanity. If he did that, that, that is um, you know, throwing a match in gasoline. That doesn't just stop there. It could unravel enormously. It's a threat to the whole world, as we're seeing with the trade wars. It's just one after another. Recognizing Jerusalem and, and, and the massacre of the Palestinians. This is all the, the, the rampage of this. It, make America great again. Make America white again. America first. Those are all slogans of a fascist regime. So um, the fact that it's the Korean Peninsula is actually in the bullseye of this fascist regime, I think we have to, have, have to come to grips with that. And that's another a, a prime reason why we need to be in the streets, and it's actually been probably the worst. I know when Refuse Fascism has called three different actions here in the wake, immediate wake of, um, of these threats against North Vietnam, um, North Korea, and um, it's been pitiful. You know, Vets for Peace have been out with us, a couple of small anti war groups have been out with us, but it's not within the purview of too much that goes as hashtag resistance. So one last and then let's give it to someone else. Just one quick comment. Chuck Schumer got up today and demanded that, that uh, Trump not negotiate with North Korea unless North Korea would give up every single bit of their arms. He, they, were, they were more hawkish than Trump at this point, so don't be looking for the Democrats on this thing. It always uh, amuses me when somebody says, before we can talk, I want you to give me everything I'm asking for. <laughs> and I don't want you to think about how, once you've given it to me, there's no need for us to talk. Um, wow. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not going to minimize how tricky it is to talk to Kim Jong-un. I'm not going to... I'm not going to offer my checkbook or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> but former CIA director James Clapper and other intelligence professionals who are really hard-nosed realists have long said that North Korea really is a, f a frightened nation, that they are, they are as belligerent as they are because they are convinced we and the rest of the world are out to squash them and we are. Um, um, somehow, and I don't think Trump is the guy to figure this out, 
somehow we have got to find a way to show them that's not what we're out to do. Outside of that, I don't have any ideas about how to proceed with North Korea, except uh, I wish we had a smarter president in there to, to try, and that we had a smarter State, uh, state Department and a, a smarter whole entourage of professionals who could advise our president a whole lot better about how to proceed. Let's, 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 uh, let's try a different president. <laughs> different, start with a different president. Thank you. Thank you for everyone who came. Uh, thank you for the people who spent a lot of time to put the slideshow together. Thank you to John, especially.